want to introduce our speakers tonight um, and give a little background on the speakers. Um, Cameron Smith has over 15 years of experience working in the GIS field, including in the last decade serving as a GIS manager for the County of Orange Public Works, where he has been instrumental in spearheading the development of cutting edge enterprise GIS. His recent endeavors include integration of artificial intelligence, drone remote sensing and process automation. Uh, prior to OC, he worked in organizations such as the city of Lawrence, Kansas, and San Bernardino, uh, San, Santa Barbara County. Um, and he's a graduate of US UCSB with a BS in physical geography. Um, I also want to introduce the two other speakers who will be sharing this talk. Um, uh, next is Jim Reed. Um, Jim has transformed his passion for drones into a fulfilling career. He has worked for eight years on the OC survey drone team, becoming his becoming its supervisor two years ago, uh, which he, the, that department utilizes drones and other reality sensing methods to support projects, including surveys, construction, environmental efforts, and business development. Um, he is a graduate of Cal Poly Pomona in regional planning and GIS. Uh, and then finally, uh, Marie Aquino, she has experience that spans a wide range of GIS responsibilities, including data management, spatial analysis, database development, and the use of GIS tools and software. She's currently serving as GIS specialist at Orange County Public Works, where she plays a vital role innovating and integrating uh, the many existing uh, systems at the Orange County John Wayne Airport. Uh, in her previous role, uh, she was the Geographic Information Officer of the GeoBase program at Los Angeles Air Force Base. Um, she holds a BS in Anthropology, uh, and geography from Cal State Fullerton. So we're uh, we're very pleased to have these speakers tonight, and um, I'm going to turn this over um, uh, uh, to Cameron. Okay, great. Good evening. All right, it's uh, an honor to talk to you guys. Um, my name is Cameron Smith. I'm the GIS manager uh, for. Orange County Public Works. Um, <clears throat> in Orange County, GIS is sort of centralized in, in public works. So uh, we serve all the different agencies and departments in the county. Um, there's 10 different agencies and departments, including uh, your healthcare agencies, social services, sheriff. Um, public works is our bread and butter. We do road and flood services, and we recently took over John Wayne Airport, and that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about um, tonight. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys. Um, let's see here. So uh, we, we got just a brief introduction already, so uh, I think we kind of hit most of this stuff. Um, myself, uh, things I enjoy, uh, mountain biking, surfing, rock climbing. Um, as a child, I loved to play the game SimCity. It was like uh, the game for me. And I've found a career where I get to basically play SimCity in real life. So uh, I think that was a, a big, big thing for me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, hit up Jim. He he loves uh, racing cars and RC copters, and uh, he's our drone supervisor. So that that was like a good good fit. Um, and and Marie's our resident yoga instructor. She she has uh, does yoga on the side and and occasionally does classes for our uh, our GIS staff. So it's great to have her on. <laughs> so that's all our interesting stuff. Um, this is us all, all mountain biking. All, all three of us uh, like to blow off steam. I, we have a large team. I have 25 uh, GIS staff that work on my team, and we have a pretty good portion of us that uh, do these sort of crazy sports. So it's fun. Um, 
what I'm going to be talking to you guys about tonight, um, a little bit of the history of Orange County GIS. Um, we're just our your neighboring county uh, on the coast and uh, talk a little bit about how uh, we grew the GIS group. Um, because when I started, there were only a handful of GIS staff in the county, um, and it wasn't very well developed, but it had been around for a long time. And over the last, let's say, five to ten years, it's really exploded, um, and I think it, it's kind of a good model for um, what, what others can do. Um, and then we're going to focus around uh, our most recent uh, project with John Wayne Airport, and um, some of the work done there, including some of the digital twin and uh, a number of the different apps that we've put together for them. So here we're gonna start into the GIS history. So uh, Orange County has been uh, a customer of Esri since the mid 1980s. We were customer number 50 or somewhere in there, early, early customer. and. Um, that did have some benefits with, uh, getting our data quality really tight. Um, and we had some sort of early visionaries, um, that helped establish GIS at the County. Um, and, but then it sort of sat dormant for a long time. We didn't have the sort of growth trajectory we, we do now. Um, we, uh, moved to the parcel fabric for managing our, our parcels uh, in 2015. And pretty much since that time, uh, we've seen a lot of growth in the county. Um, one of the things that sort of separates us from a lot of other uh, agencies, counties, is uh, our control network. Um, we have uh, established a, a GPS control network, a passive GPS control network in 1991, which um, spans across the entire county. You can see uh, the map with the red dots. Each of those is a GPS control point that uh, either a horizontal or vertical control point. And all of our maps that get recorded in the county have to tie into a GPS control point. And what that means for us is that we have really high precision and accuracy in our parcel base map. And that is sort of the, um, data set that feeds all other data sets in the county. And we have pretty high confidence that any of our line work that is uh, anywhere in our GIS system is accurate within a foot. Um, and in a lot of places, much greater than that. So um, I, I think that's been a really valuable th tool that we had set up really early on. And then in 2003, we established the Orange County Real-Time Network, which is uh, GPS real-time base stations that are continuously monitoring their position that we can use for a correction of real-time GPS measurements. So um, you get, uh, you can do RTK GPS measurements anywhere in the county and get really highly accurate um, measurements. One of the things that I think really benefited the county was um, establishing a steering committee and user group early on. So in 2014, I was uh, at Orange County Parks and uh, I saw a need to really collaborate with others in the county. And I was looking to some sort of GIS leadership, like who's out there that's organizing this? And there just wasn't anyone stepping up. <laughs> and and finally, uh, I had a meeting with our CEO and they said, it's you, <laughs> you, you need to do this. And uh, so I coordinated with all the different agencies and departments and um, we established this steering committee and formed a charter um, that helped uh, the development of our GIS talent in the county and um, served as uh, a body to form some governing uh, governance structures. Um, and this led into us getting an enterprise agreement with Esri. Um, so that allowed us to expand our licensing from just the few who had access before to anyone in the county now having the ability to grow the GIS system. And I think that was a really key tool to us expanding our use. Um, 
this is just a little org chart. <laughs> Don't really need to pay too much attention to it, but I, I have a team of about 25 GIS staff and that's pretty large <laughs> relative to most other counties. And I'm really beneficial that I, I've got uh, a lot of talented individuals. A lot of people want to live in Orange County. And I, I have a talented group that has sort of proven themselves. And we have people seek out our team that that want to work with us. So um, we have a great team that have uh, specialties in drones, remote sensing. Uh, we have a few different PhDs on our team um, with backgrounds in AI, machine learning, computer science. We have custom programmers that are on my team. So we have a lot of specialties that you don't maybe necessarily get on your average GIS group. Um, and I think that's led to a lot of our success. Um, one of the things that I think sets us apart is a focus on emerging technologies. Um, a few of the ones that I've talked about briefly our drone program we established in 2015 when drones really were just coming on the scene. Um, we we do a lot of custom application development to serve all the various needs that, that people have. Um, we've worked a lot with 3D data, um, playing with augmented reality and virtual reality for different um, use cases. Um, and we, we've been exploring AI and machine learning uh, well before chat GPT sort of came to the scene. Um, and it's it's been an amazing sort of transformative tool for us. And I'll share some of that um, with you later. Um, and then LiDAR and reality capture has been a big focus of ours and really enables people to work more efficiently. And we'll share that with uh, the, the airport use case. So our geospatial artificial intelligence and um, I'm going to sort of share how we got into this and um, a few of the different use cases that we've explored. Um, so we have, we're like I said before, we're, we're public works. Um, one of the things that we manage is all the sidewalks and curb ramps in the county. Um, and so we were tasked with doing an ADA curb ramp inventory, something that the county had um, sort of on their radar. It's a big source of lawsuits for many counties is if you're not in ADA compliance, you are sort of setting yourself up to be liable. Um, and the way it had been done, and it was sort of slowly, slowly progressing, was someone was going around to every single curb and driving around and looking for ramps and measuring them by hand. And we're like, we can do this better. This is this is low hanging fruit for, for a GIS application. Um, so this is the first application we built. Um, we scanned all the county roads um, with a, a LIDAR scanner from a, a vehicle. And um, from that LIDAR, we can see the point cloud data that we're zooming in on here. That yellow um, patch in the center, that's the detectable warning surface um, that is required by uh, the state. And um, we can then do a series of measurements on it. And, and we test those measurements against both our county standards and the 2010 ADA standards. So we can put points in the map and those measurements are automatically calculated to see whether or not they meet those standards. And then that data is then stored on that ramp. And within a couple minutes, we can visit each ramp um, rather than having to drive around and take manual measurements, which each day you might get to a handful where we can do hundreds a day with this method. Um, we explored other more automated um, functions for doing this, including automatic automatic detection of the ramp. Um, so looking for that, you know, detectable warning surface, looking for the slope characteristics and automating this entire workflow. Um, it was not as successful as the, the sort of pseudo manual process that I just showed you. Um, we had some successes, but 
in in order to capture everything, we really decided we needed a human involved in the process. Um, so this was our sort of first um, foray into some of the AI work that we were doing. And we're using this for road feature detection as well. So that same data set that fed um, our curb ramp inventory, we're like, what else can we do with this? Um, we have we manage all our road features and flood features in the county, and, and it costs not an insignificant amount of money to drive a LIDAR unit through the county. So we want to maximize that, that benefit. Um, so here's a look at a 360 photosphere that comes from that, uh, that drive that we went through the county with. And it takes a picture of one of these photospheres every like 10 feet. And it creates a ton of data. So um, what we do is we crop that that whole photosphere into a usable area um, and create eight different photos from it. And then we can sort of put those photos in your imagination in a circle around you. And we can then run that through uh, various different uh, computer vision programs. We used Azure, um, but we also experimented with some of the Google uh, machine learning tools. So in this instance, we're detecting a stop sign. Um, here we can see, you know, it's detecting a car and a stop sign. We're getting uh, electrical towers, vans, all sorts of other things. One of the funny things that happened, uh, we just sort of used the stock uh, tool without training it initially. And we started seeing um, after we put it through our system and we detected where the positions were relative to the, to the cars and we could put points on a map for each of these detections um, in a pretty accurate position. Um, one of the things we found was there were, we, we drove this in December and we saw a bunch of animals on the rooftops of, of our houses. And we're like, what is going on? <laughs> It was, you know, people had reindeer that they had put on their roofs for, for Christmas. So it's, you know, it's not a perfect system. It's, you still have to interpret it. But um, we're going to be using this for all sorts of different detections from manholes, storm drains, signs, um, fire hydrants. You know, these are things that we've had an inventory of, but it's always important to update and continue to see, you know, what if a sign got hit and knocked over and, we don't detect it. Well, that's a good thing for us, our crews to know and, and go and check out. So um, so John Wayne Airport, we, we took over, uh, Public Works took over the operations, maintenance, and engineering of, of John Wayne Airport uh, a little over a year ago. And um, there were a lot of projects that needed our help. <laughs> yeah, they, they needed um, GIS data. They needed some of the benefits of a digital twin, um, just sort of data management in general was was a big thing for the airport. And um, so I'll, Marie is going to talk a lot more about this in, in a minute, but um, I think a lot of the applications that we make help do that same sort of pattern of data-driven decision-making um, at the airport as we have uh, done with other um, things for public works. So. Um, with that, I'm going to invite Maria up. And First and foremost, thank you everyone for spending your awesome Tuesday night here with us talking about um, John Wayne Airport and other things Orange County. I am super excited to talk to you about the GIS at John Wayne Airport, um, also referred to sometimes as SNA. I gave a similar um, presentation two years ago at a meeting um, talking about the GIS innovation that was going on since OCPW stepped in. Um, it was at that time that we established a more modern fluid system, you know, updating the users at the airport, you know, their tools and their, their methods, and in some cases, um, taking users from using paper maps and getting them onto web maps, set up with custom tools and all that good stuff. Um, it was then that the GIS was coming together one project at a time. Um, data was being migrated into these data models 
following requirements established by the FAA and other high level, you know, spatial data um, standards for facilities, infrastructure and environment set forth by the industry. Um, so with the progression of the projects, the various data inputs were coming in together quite nicely and in some cases being put to use for the first time. Um, and then here I am today, two years later, talking to you about the, the GIS and how it is, has evolved. Um, I now, for this presentation, I you know refer to it as an integrated GIS. Um, hence the, the title Flight JWA-SNA-GIS 2.0, essentially just taking it up the next level. So um, the system, the GIS system now, aligns data into three models, air side, land side, and our utility model. I say the system um, aligns the data in these three different models because there are um, a number of areas of overlap. One example of overlap is that in the utilities model, we depict um, subsurface utilities as well as above ground utilities. And the, the above ground utilities is important for to be depicted as well in the air side um, model because the air side model strives to depict everything in the um, airport boundary, all of the elements that are vertical. So um, it's not to say that one belongs in either or, it's just whatever framework a user needs to work in, they're gonna find everything they need in that, in that um, model. So yes, let me, um, in, let me introduce the, the air side model. The GIS model for airport air site operations provides a comprehensive framework for spatial analysis to take place. This model sets up users with an environment useful for managing the various elements and activities on airfield grounds. So this is everything that's within the airport boundary. The model integrates GIS and BIM. BIM is business and is building information um, model. It can be used as a tool to enhance decision-making processes related to runway configurations, taxiway planning, aircraft parking, and just overall airside infrastructure. By employing this model, J JWA SNA is prepared to optimize the overall functionality of the airport's airside operations. So here um, we have the airfield. It is our 2D airside model, um, depicting everything within the boundary. The, the blue rectangles, those are all building facilities. Um, and this big one down here is the terminal, the main terminal. So this is kind of like the bread and butter of the, the airport. We operate first and foremost safely at the airport. So this is gonna give users everything they need to see that's happening big time on the grounds of the airport because we're dealing with these big things, right? Um, that take up airspace, which by the way, we also manage the airspace at the airport um, since we stepped in. Here is a... Here is the sister model to the 2D. This is our 3D. It depicts our airspace surfaces. This is um, basically our FAA circular advisory um, requirement that we have these surfaces so we know all obstructions within the area of the runway or even on the runway because sometimes there are signs or trees, wind socks. And so yeah, the. The 3D model of uh, the 3D air side model depicts everything vertical to help with these important, you know, planning and decision making things that are happening. Um, primary users of the air side are the, the airport engineers. Um, let me 
went through some different. Let me turn off the surfaces to get a little better picture of everything. Is this is kind of a fan favorite for visual of the airport. Um, another way to think of our air side is just all the things happening that don't involve customers and travelers. So that's our air side model. Next is the land side model. The GIS model for airport land side operations offers a comprehensive framework for overseeing layouts of areas outside the realm of, of air side, namely the interior. This model integrates CAD, BIM, and GIS to facilitate efficient planning and decision making and managing of indoor spaces. Um, the model aims to optimize airline and vendor lease agreements, um, enhance passenger experience, and streamline logistical activities within the airport landside environment. Um, we again have a 2D and 3D approach to landside. Here is our 3D. Um, this data comes from BIM, but it's, it is accessible through GIS. Um, we can fly into our model and check out things in our airport, like assets, LED, electrical equipment, LED screen, I think it's like 32 inches. So giving you insight. Um, that is how we think of and model our land side in 3D. So the application of the land side model in managing space use at the airport is essential for optimizing operations, um, ensuring safety and security, and improving passenger experience, which overall we can achieve cost effectiveness. Um, the business benefits include enhanced efficiency in decision making, again, um, in accordance with compliance and regulations. Um, it has potential to increase revenue generation because you know the more efficient we are at operating these spaces, um, the potential for attracting um, airlines and vendors, which is how we make money at the airport. And you know, the chances for enhanced revenue streams for the airport through increased traffic and improved services, yeah. So basically, one goal of mine is to maybe make John Wayne so, you know, efficient in GIS that we attract more tropical airlines. <laughs> that's my that's my little motivation there. I live in Orange County. So um, here, this might look familiar if you're familiar with indoors. We basically are following the indoors, the Esri indoors model to model our um, land side, our 2D land side. Here we can get insight on, into these different spaces, the square footage, because that's how we charge vendors and, um, and airlines is by the square footage they use in the airport. So it's, it's important that these, this um, information, the non-spatial information is accurate and we can put as much data in there as needed. So our final model, utility, the utility model represents the subsurface and above ground utilities at the airport. It provides a framework that incorporates both, both visible and hidden elements of the utility networks. Um, it shows distribution, interconnection, and associated geographic context. Fact, subsurface utilities encompass the intricate network of pipes, cables, and conduits buried underneath the Earth's surface, while above ground utilities include visible components such as poles and towers and structures, all of which are assets. And this is where we integrate um, asset data to the GIS so that it can show up and we can facilitate you know, effective management of the assets. Um, not only that, it can contribute to improving planning, maintenance, emergency, emergency response, and just overall resilience of the campus. 
Um, this is what is going to drive asset management is what is going to drive our utility model. It's barely in the um, beginning stages of being put together. It's only been like two years. So yeah, this is going to be our driving factor, asset management. One of our big projects coming up is um, segmenting, segmenting the utilities and um, attributing it so that we can just get a better, paint a better picture of the assets at, at, at the airport because that's going to be um, our bread and butter to the ALP, the, a the airport layout plan, which is basically serves as a like a general plan, a five year or a 10 year. We use it to leverage funding and all that other good stuff. Um, so after safety and security, the preservation of assets is the next highest priority uh, according to the FAA Airport Improvement Program Funding Priority System. Um, maintaining a sound utility model aids in, a, in preventative maintenance system and is essential to extending the lifespan of the, the airport facility. And so asset, asset management, that's one lead into our integrated system. At the airport, we have at the center is our airport owner. And essentially, the, we take care of the, the airport owner, the county. Um, we take care of the facility and we continue the operations of the facility through the, the systems already in happening and going on like business development which they manage all of our leases um, with the airlines and vendors and then we have here advocacy groups industry groups um, government partners FAA TSA and then stakeholders like community and um, airport customers and airlines so all these systems that are already in existing to get this airport operating, we could just make it that much um, efficient of a tool, their systems by integrating GIS. Um, it enhances overall safety by providing accurate spatial information for real-time decision-making. And it improves the efficiency of optimizing operations and other activities within the model. Here's one example of an integration. We um, we man we input our field services projects into Power BI, Microsoft Power BI, and GIS is great because you get all of these um, API libraries that can connect our GIS to our business information, um, just to overall have a better picture of the field services projects that are going on at the airport. Because again, we always want to know what's going on the, the airside grounds. And as you can see by the map here, we have lots of projects. Um, to get more insight, you have to click on it and then you could see updated information being fed into um, our dashboard from the, the query that we, we uploaded or we used to get the info from Power BI. So, yeah, and then, you know, dashboards are great because there's so much, in, there's so much insight, there's abilities to get charts and just see right away, you know, important um, details. So, with the data in it, the, the integrated systems, we also have data flow. Data flow between GIS and other non-spatial information is a dynamic process that enables accessibility to information across various stages of a project's life cycle. An example of data flow is that between CAD, BIM, and GIS, you have the, an exchange of information from your design, the CAD, through comprehensive modeling, the, the BIM, and the spatial analysis, the, the GIS. Um, this flow is going to enhance everything at the airport um, from architecture and engineering to urban planning and geographical analysis and aviation science and goat yoga, just to keep it interesting. And I didn't have any AI being images to put in here, but um, yeah, I hope this was useful um, insight to connecting your business uses to with GIS and 
you know, see the potential there is in other areas that you can, you know, apply your discipline to airport, you know, science, airport management science and GIS. So my name is Jim Reed. Uh, I'm the drone su team supervisor for Orange County Surveyor. Uh, I believe I have probably one of the best jobs in the county. Um, it's not every day you get to play with drones, you get paid for it. My boss heard me say, I play with drones, I'd get in trouble. So what I want to start out saying is, yes, we do drones, but we also do a lot more than drones. Um, we have guys that are database managers. We have guys who administrate servers. We have a video FX team. Um, so the point I want to make right off the bat is drones are just a tool, just like GIS. So don't think that you're going to go out and just do drones. Some people have done that, but it's a whole lot easier if you have something else to work with the drones. Uh, so our drone team has been, sorry, I keep walking away from the mic. Our drone team has been active since 2015. Uh, it started out with just me and my supervisor at the time. We've grown that team to as many as six people. Uh, in that time, uh, we've flown over 150 projects coming up on 200. We have thousands of flights under our belts. Uh, we've run into regulatory hurdles um, and, and you know, learning to navigate those regulations is always a challenge. It's an ongoing uh, and developing field. So that, that's not gonna change anytime soon. Uh, within Public Works, uh, we support all the different agencies. Um, that includes parks, uh, operations and maintenance, OCFA, uh, survey is our primary customer, client is what I might call them. Um, so you got a, a few examples of the projects we've done here. And so when you're using drones, uh, it's all about adding value, right? So you can go out and take a pretty picture. Okay, that, that's worth something. But how do you make that uh, usable to a project manager? Um, so one thing you can do is documentation, right? Um, so you've got your like standard oblique imagery, you can take videos. Uh, one of the products that we use very frequently and is probably one of our most popular uh, deliverables is uh, a virtual tour. So these drones can automatically take a 360 degree image uh, you throw it into like basically your real estate tour software and it's like Google Street View in the sky. Um, so you can look anywhere you want. It's a, it's a very useful tool for us. Uh, and then we also create these web apps. Uh, what's cool about the web apps is all of our, our, the data we capture is hosted in that web app. We can send out one URL to our project managers. They've got access to all the data we captured, download links, service links, you name it. Uh, so this is a, an example of our mapping products, high resolution orthos. Uh, we also fly LIDAR. Um, so basically that, that allows us to penetrate vegetation. So here you've got a, a DSM on the right and a DEM on the left. So basically a bare earth. But we also have 3D products. So uh, point clouds is, is probably our most useful uh, product. Uh, we use a, an application called Poetry. It's open source and we host it on our own servers. Uh, and you can take basic measurements, take profiles uh, for basic like QC, QA, or QA, QC. Um, this is a very useful tool. Uh, but again, we provide all this data as download links so they can take it into TBC, AutoCAD, whatever it might be. Uh, these are some of the tools we use. Um, so for documentation, we, we have a couple Mav Mavic 3s. Uh, we use a GoPro, we'll slap that on top of a truck, go drive through neighborhoods and basically do our own Google Street View. Uh, and these are, this is our mapping equipment. Um, so up top, we've got our M300, we've got the P1 sensor on there. That's a 42 megapixel sensor, full frame, uh, global shutter, it's great. Uh, bottom left, we've got our LiDAR unit. That's a, a GOQ TrueView 535. Uh, what's cool about that is not only is it a good LiDAR sensor, but it's got three RGB cameras on it. So basically, if you want to capture the entire site in one go, that's that's your best bet. And then we also tie into survey control. So we've got uh, an R12i, uh, which we sometimes use as a base station. We basically set up on a known point, and then our entire survey 
is relative to that point. If you're a surveyor, that's important. Um, and then we've got another R10 that we might use for like a base rover setup. So if we need to set additional aerial targets, uh, that's the type of equipment we'll use. Okay, so we had a bunch of a success uh, implementing drones for public works. You know, flying during the day, abiding by the regulations. And we had so much success that when we took over John Wayne, Cameron, our county surveyor said, hey, what do you think about flying drones at the airport? And I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> drones and airports, they don't mix. Um, and they're like, no, we're serious, figure it out. So that's that's how we started down this road. Um, so obviously there, there are challenges. Uh, first people you call is the airport authority. They weren't very receptive in the beginning. And then we were like, no, we're serious. And they're like, okay, we'll figure something out. Uh, the FAA had to get involved and it's not just your regional center. We were talking about the tower. Um, they originally weren't very receptive. And then we found out there was a loophole. Uh, every eight weeks, they closed down the entire airfield for maintenance. That was the only way we were gonna get out there. Not to mention, this airfield closure is in the middle of the night. So it starts at 11 o'clock PM, goes to five in the morning. We don't normally work those hours. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we get access to the airport and then there's logistics of the, the people who are out there, right? Uh, you've got the airport staff, they're doing maintenance out there. So we're operating in the same general areas. We're trying not to interfere with what they're doing. Uh, so we had to get basically buddy buddy uh, with their own M team. Uh, air traffic, yes, the airfield's closed, but the sheriffs are still flying out of there. So we had to get basically their radio uh, frequencies and monitor their air traffic. We got to the point where they'd call us up and be like, hey, we're gonna take off. Where are you guys at? And we're like, oh, we're way over here. Okay, cool. Um, local law enforcement. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of something called an aeroscope. It's, uh, it's basically a device that DJI has. It allows them to pick up any DJI drone within a 14 mile radius. Turns out Irvine PD has one of these things. Um, we found out after the fact. <laughs> uh, so pretty much uh, I got a phone call the next day and said uh, the people at Okayak, which is basically a, a fusion group of all the local law enforcement agencies, uh, had been getting emails all night about drones operating at John Wayne. I'm like, oh, sorry, that was us. Um, so turns out Department of Homeland Security and the FBI are also part of that fusion group. So we may or may not be on a watch list. We'll find out. Down to more practical problems. We're flying at night. We're flying with a camera without a flash. How's that going to work? Uh, the proposed projects were started with a roof inspection. And then they were doing some maintenance on uh, airfield striping. So they basically were going to remove it all. And they wanted us to get out there before that and capture everything that was in place. So they could basically replace it after the fact. Uh, and this is what we came up with. Uh, there's a company out there called Fox Fury. Great name. Uh, we bought as many as we could. And we strapped them to our drones. So the M300, we put four of these guys on. Uh, our Mavics, we could put one on there. Uh, and then it was just a game of keeping the batteries charged. Uh, this is kind of an example of what we were seeing. So um, we got an example of both the roof. So on the left, you'll notice it's kind of like a, a metal uh, roofing material. It's reflective. Uh, that caused problems for us down the road. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and then we got the uh, airfield striping. And then this picture with the helicopter, I think that gives you a good idea of how much light this thing's putting down. What we found is we had to fly it about between 60 and 75 feet, which is actually really low. Uh, and then we're using an RGB camera with a 35 millimeter lens. So that's a relatively narrow uh, field of view. Uh, so we had to do flight planning um, with basically tons and tons of flight lines. So uh, I should also add, it, it's dark, right? And if you know anything about photography, it's how much light are you letting in, into the lens? Um, so we had to keep our shutter open for longer. Uh, that contributed to motion blur. 
And so we had to reduce our flight speed. So basically we're looking at long nights is what I want to get at. Um, video. This is kind of a cool video. Um, one drone chasing another drone. What could go wrong? Um, yeah, so there you go. That That's a good example. And you can see how slowly it's moving. Um, and remember, we're supposed to fly the entire roof of the terminal and large portions of the runway. And this thing's going at like 10 feet per second. So basically what I just said, um, I mean, you can see the roof, it's huge. Uh, down here in this uh, plan view, uh, basically all the colored areas is what they wanted us to fly. Um, yeah, so whenever we're flying uh, for design purposes, uh, survey controls everything. Um, luckily, we work very closely with our surveyors. Uh, they had uh, a control network in place on the airfield. Um, so we were able to use our base rover setup, which is what the guys are setting up, up over there in the corner, uh, set our own control. Uh, and basically what we did is set up on uh, hard corners of the striping, things we could photo ID and post. This actually worked out really well. Um, oh, I've got some AI generated images. Uh, I'm sure you can, we'll see if you can spot them. Um, yeah, so we're out there at 11 o'clock night after night. Um, it was just like a, a caffeine fueled drone fest. Um, uh, that's kind of what I imagined we looked like at the end of that week. Uh, this is supposed to say processing. Um, this, this is supposed to be one of our guys in the office. Uh, beer enthusiast sits behind his desk and throws his legs up. Um, Okay, so we capture all the data. What do you do with it? This is an example of just one small portion of the airfield. Um, it's kind of like that little pink turn um, kind of on the, the west side. Uh, just this one section was over 1,200 photos. And remember, each photo is 42 megapixels. Uh, all of these sections total um, we were looking at somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 photos. Uh, so you need processing power. Thankfully, we have multiple high-powered machines. Uh, to generate these orthos, we were actually, as we were flying them, the next day we were able to provide an ortho to our design team. I would also have you note the accuracy. For striping, you're only concerned in, about horizontal accuracy, so not vertical, nothing in the Z we were hitting within 500. So these are checkpoints. We're not constraining uh, our uh, our model to these control points. So that kind of gives you the warm and fuzzy feelings when you talk to your surveyors. Uh, this is how we delivered it. Again, it's with a web app. You can view the high resolution ortho imagery. We've got the download links. Uh, everything is set up for, for use in AutoCAD. Okay, so the roof, the roof was interesting. Um, I mentioned those reflective uh, metallic roo uh, roofing material that they used. Uh, basically it wreaked havoc on photogrammetry. Um, we wouldn't get any point returns in those areas. So our ortho mosaics were looking like, you know, jagged, uh, just kind of like a bunch of artifacts, unusable. Um, so the solution we came up with was we would use LIDAR to basically capture the, the surface of the roof and then apply our photogrammetry mission to that surface. So this was an additional 8,140 photos. And the result is, wow, there's sound, okay. Um, I'm just gonna pause that, you get the idea. Uh, this really cool 3D model, um, and it was accurate. You take measurements off of it. Um, but for us, what we were looking for is damage in the uh, in that metallic roof. So uh, on the right hand of the screen, you can see how that's kind of become deformed. That was something that the contractors were interested in. 
Uh, we're also looking for areas where uh, there was ponded water. Um, also, as a bonus, we would find sandbags and tarps. I figured that was a pretty clear indicator of the problem. Wow. Um, remember the 360-degree uh, photos, uh, the virtual tours? Uh, this came in handy whenever there was an overhang. You can basically look underneath. to get some really clear imagery. Uh, and then the other thing, the other concern the contractors had were uh, the gutters. And the gutters really didn't come out in the ortho imagery or the top-down imagery. Uh, so this was a great tool for that. We didn't really find any issues, so um, that was easy. Okay, um, this goofy thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about interior scanning. Um, so to kind of set this up for you guys, uh, we, before we took over John Wayne, um, we had consultants scan the entire terminal and that started in 2016. Uh, from my understanding, they delivered the data in 2018 and between 2018 to 2020, they built out the BIM model. Um, there, no updates had been done uh, since that data had been delivered. And so we're taking over. We want to update our BIM model, make sure we're working with most current data. How can we do that in a fast and efficient way? Uh, in addition, if we can capture any assets, that's just an added bonus. Well, we the solution we came up with was the Navis VLX. Um, this is a SLAM-based scanner. SLAM is simultaneous location and mapping. Um, it's kind of hard to describe how that works, but basically if you think about this device capturing a 3D image and then you move and it captures another 3D image and then another, another, and so on, it's taking that point and stitching it with the, the 3D image before and after. And so basically it's mapping the environment as you move through it. And so that's called local slam. Global slam is as you're moving through an environment and you come back to an area that it recognizes that you've been through before, it'll recognize, hey, I've been here, and basically tighten up your trajectories and improve your accuracies. In addition, this device can check on check in on physical control. You can say, hey, the point like where you see the guy holding it up against the wall, this is a known coordinate. You plug that in, and that'll further tighten up the trajectory and georeference the model. Uh, this is not the airport, but it gives you an idea of um, how this thing kind of works. The, on the right side, that kind of overview plan map, uh, that yellow line is the path that the uh, operator took moving through the environment. That entire facility was captured in less than an hour. In addition uh, to the two LiDAR pucks that this device has, it has five, maybe six RGB cameras capturing 360 degree imagery. So basically you get your Google Street View through a facility. And then the point cloud is colorized uh, with the, that camera data. Uh, one thing that we, we push in our group is redundant data sets. So uh, I've got, you know, my group uses drones. We use this backpack scanner, both of which are reliant on algorithms. So you basically feed the data to the computer and then trust that the black box is going to give you something good in return. The surveyors have a little more um, of a tried and true method. Um, they're setting up a static scanner, so a st scanner on one point, on an on a known point, backsighting it, and then scanning. It's a much slower method of data capture, but it's highly, highly accurate. So what we'll do is bring all of these data sets into the same environment and compare them. Um, so in this profile view with the three different colors, we've got the UAV data, static scanner, and mobile scanner, and they all line up right on top of each other. So that gives us confidence that the data we're providing is accurate. Sound. This is two hours worth of work. Um, this is the entire rental car facility for John Wayne. Um, you see how many cars are here? If you're doing this with a static scanner, you scan in one location, any obstructions, you're going to get shadowing. Um, so the number of setups to do this 
would just be prohibitively time intensive. In addition uh, to the, the scanner, it comes with uh, a hosting service. Um, this hosting service is called Ivion. Um, and what we found is that we could add more value to the system if we used it to extract assets. Um, so from your desktop, after you've captured the 360 degree imagery, you've got your geometry in the form of a point cloud, you can go through, navigate your facility, drop points on, I think these are uh, elevator actuators, um, control boxes, you know, whatever it might be, uh, attribute them, add additional photos if you have it. I don't know why this is like on autoplay. Um, and then the idea is, is that we can export that out, bring it into a, a CMS like asset works, and then that will eventually tie into the Ezra environment, which would be ArcGIS indoors. Uh, another new feature, and we were working with the manufacturer, um, so they actually gave us early access to this. Uh, this is an application for your phone, which utilizes the imagery from the VLX, um, and it allows you to locate yourself within a scan. The advantage to this is, is if you're in a GPS denied environment, so basically anything indoors, you can still get a position, um, and then you can drop uh, these POIs or points of interest uh, and get accurate geometry for them. So you see here, Greg is, uh, he was navigating through the, the environment. He dropped his pin. He's attributing uh, this point of interest. I think we'll add a couple of photos. I'll just let this one play for a minute. Moves in a little closer, gets the asset number. And then he'll go back. He'll start moving around the environment. And again, you can see that there are other assets that have already been dropped. And just to let you know, the way that this was done in the past and really is still being done is a clipboard and a spreadsheet. Um, we can do better, right? So this is the direction we're moving. Um, I'm not gonna pretend that it's all in place at this point, but we've got the tools, um, we've got the, the depth of knowledge in our group. Um, it's just a matter of time until we get this implemented. And that's it for me. So uh, we have time for a few questions uh, for any or all of the speakers. And we have mics here in the room. So just raise your hand. And if you're online, just uh, send a, a chat message. And uh, uh, Dr. Ren will uh, proceed to uh, tell us what the questions are. So let, let's start in the room. Are there some questions in the room? Uh, hello. OK. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, point clouds, because uh, you guys would use that to get the measurements, correct? Uh, would uh, did you get would were the do the point clouds uh, use AI to determine the the measurements in between each point that you place, or no? So there's a few different ways we use point clouds. Um, one is from the lidar scanner that's sending out lasers in all directions. And it's getting returns of those lasers and measuring the distance and height and elevation that is being returned. Um, so that can generate that point cloud. The other way we get point clouds is through um, the photogrammetry. So we're overlapping images on top of each other. And the same way you can see in 3D by overlapping your two eye images, um, it does that with photos. Um, and it can generate points that for each position that have overlaps um, and that generates the point cloud. So, um, and we don't use AI for that right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious because on how it would determine it. So it's just like, so it'd be pretty accurate. Wait, uh, would, does it combine the, both the, the light and the picture overlap? Or? You can, you can take the, 
the LIDAR imagery and colorize it um, with the photos. So um, you know the positions of the photos and you can colorize the points that are being captured by the LIDAR, which the LIDAR is just capturing points and it'll return sort of colorless points. And you can colorize them based on elevation or you can colorize them based on the intensity of the return or by uh, colorizing it with the photos that you take. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Anika. Um, I ha I'm just curious. Um, uh, I forgot his name. Sorry. Uh, you shared the presentation at the last uh, period uh, that you are just sh you are just sharing the whole um, security things. I don't know. It's like security things or not. But when you are capturing all the things like inside airports, like the public people, we don't know about this, right? So how do you ensure the security things here? Yeah, I can address some of that and maybe Jim can address some. I, I, we don't, um, these aren't public apps. These are just um, private to the county. But some of the things that we try not to show ever are like the baggage handling areas. There are secure areas of, of the airport. Um, Jim, do you have any other? I uh yeah, so the the application that we're using, um, we created a completely separate instance for JWA. So only JWA staff with the proper security uh, can view those. And that application is used by big industry. So oil, car manufacturers, um, the security is pretty robust. Oh, okay, thank you. And I absolutely love your like drone works. Uh, like where do you wanna like the the works you are doing now? Like what what are the outcomes you wanna see after ten years? So the the outcomes we want to see at the airport in ten years, um, there's gonna be a sort of a culture shift that needs to take place um, at the airport from that sort of manual process of going and visiting each site that you need to to explore to. Um, being able to do measurements from your computer to being able to look up lease information from your computer and use it for data-driven decision-making, feeding our asset management system, our CMMS, and being able to set replacement schedules and form our budgets. Um, all these things are feeding that sort of data-driven um, analytics that we're, we're looking to have employed at the airport. Thank you so much. I also one more question to Mary. Um, I'm I'm a new student in GIS sector. So I was just wondering you showed uh, 3D models and everything. I really enjoyed it. But uh, like uh, the airport model you showed, like um, what GIS tools and software do you find most valuable to make the whole things? Yeah, you have you have to use um scene, arc scene to migrate BIM BIM data into GIS. Um because I think a I think you can't a, a regular user couldn't just up um pull up a, a Revit model, you know, but G Esri and GIS we can make the, the models accessible to, you know, any any person at the airport, any user at the airport who has no, you know background in, in CAD or GIS. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm interested in how you might use this to convert more of the ground operations to electrification. I noticed at SFO, almost all the ground equipment is plugged in now and being recharged. Are you are you expecting that? Has that begun yet? And how might, how might these tools help somebody planning for that? Because I know there's a lot of infrastructure that has to change to go from fossil fuel ground operations to um, electrified. Sure, yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're in the beginning stages and we're basically trying, we're building the data so that we can do those things. Um, yeah, like I, I mentioned earlier, we, we were taking a lot of paper things and uh, files that were just sitting on shelves and just roaming through it and lining it up with the, the different models and yeah, so potentially in the future, yeah, it's 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 we're headed that way. We're a small airport, but um, I did have a meeting with SFO not too long ago, just just talking GIS and um, 
it felt really good after the meeting because all of the the things that we had lined up, like the three models, it it mirrors what they're doing. They just named it different things. Yeah, and uh, our our group isn't really the ones that are making those decisions. We are trying to put the tools in people's hands to to be able to make. There's a online question from Wright, and uh, he asks, "What software do you use for the matched point cloud?" Yeah, or to generate the point cloud, I assume. Yeah, I I think that's the yeah. For example, um, how you um, uh, generate the matched point clouds from lidar. Yeah, so our go-to processing software it's AgiSoft MetaShape, and that's for photogrammetry. Uh, you can do the same thing using lidar, uh, using a program called it's produced by GeoQ, and the software is LP three hundred and sixty. Thank you.